Hi, everybody. It's Miss Amanda here again. Welcome to our October DMSO at home family concert. We're so excited to have you here for a special treat with the principal brass section of the Des Moines Symphony Orchestra. We're really excited to have you because this one's extra special. I tend to say that a lot, although I think that everything we're doing is extra special that we get to work with you guys and play music for you. So, First off, we're gonna talk about a little bit of what is a brass instrument? Can you guys think in your heads, does a brass instrument look shiny? Is it black and long like a clarinet? Is a clarinet a brass instrument? Hmm, what do brass instruments look like? Oh, I bet they're pretty shiny. All right, so what's really great about this is that you're gonna actually be able to hear some brass instruments today from some really cool people too. They're gonna talk to you about their instruments, about why they started playing their instruments and kind of what their favorite thing about them is. So let's take a peek at where the brass section sits in the symphony. Here's a picture to show you where they are. If you see, they're blue. So they're kind of in the back of the symphony. If you were to be looking at the symphony on stage, they're going to be further towards the back of the stage, a little bit harder to see. And the next time that you're at the symphony, make sure you peek for them. I guarantee you'd be able to hear them though. That's kind of why they have them sit so far away is because their instruments project so loud. So what is a brass instrument? Brass instruments typically made of brass, and also the musicians buzz their lips, which you'll see in a little bit too, to make the air go through a lot of long pipes and out a bell. So, are you guys ready? Don't forget, if you have any questions for our Des Moines Symphony musicians, leave them in the comments below. At the very end, we are going to have a Q&A with all of the musicians put together and we'll answer all of your questions. So make sure you stick around so you can hear your questions answered live by the principal brass section of the Des Moines Symphony Orchestra. Again, thank you for joining us today. We're so excited to have you. And here we go with our very first musician. We have Mr. Andrew. Andrew, how are you today? Good, Amanda, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for joining us. Andrew, where are you right now? Well, I am at my home in Kansas City. This is my office where I do all my practicing and just here to play for you and answer any questions that you might have. Awesome. Andrew, that's really cool that you're all the way in Kansas City and we're still able to hear you play hosted by the Des Moines Symphony here in Des Moines, Iowa. I think that's a pretty special thing that we're able to do right now. Absolutely. So, Thank you for having, you know, thank you for joining us. Um, Andrew plays for the Des Moines Symphony. He also has played for the Kansas City Symphony, Colorado Symphony Orchestra, Fort Collins Symphony. I mean, music takes you all over. And that's something that's really cool. Andrew, I know you play the trumpet man, but I'm so excited to hear what you have to present for us today. Are you ready to take off? Let's do it. All right, Andrew, all you. Thank you. All right, everybody. So let's talk a little bit about the trumpet. One thing, when you become a professional trumpet player, you have to own like a lot of different instruments. So I'm going to show you just a few that I play almost every day. A normal looking C trumpet. A C trumpet with rotors instead of valves a flugelhorn, a cornet, a piccolo trumpet, all kinds of different instruments. So what I thought I would do is kind of give you a real brief history of the trumpet and then do some playing for you. Now trumpets have been around for thousands of years. In fact, when they discovered King Tut's tomb, back, oh, I don't know, 100 years or so ago, they found trumpets that were played way back in ancient Egypt, and they were just big, long tubes, and they sounded terrible. Thankfully, over the years, we've evolved instruments to sound a lot better, and for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the trumpet really was only used in military purposes to sound calls to go do some stuff, and it wasn't until maybe four or 500 years ago that a trumpet actually became 
an instrument for art music. And the instrument that they played back then in the 15, 1600s looked a lot different. In fact, it looked like this. Now this doesn't look like a normal trumpet that we play, does it? This actually is called a Baroque trumpet because that's the time of musical period that it was used. And what do you not see on this trumpet? You don't see any vowels. So trumpet players had to blow into this and make different notes just by their mouth. Now over the years, we developed valves. And here's a valve. And what happens with a valve is you see these different holes in there? When we blow into a trumpet and we push one of those valves down, it sends air through those holes and sends it to different pipes all along the instrument. And that's how we can change notes. So what I thought I would do is play some music for you from different eras. And I'm going to start back in the Baroque time but instead of using the Baroque trumpet, I'm going to use a modern piccolo trumpet. Now, this is a, this is a song by Jeremiah Clark, and it's called The Prince of Denmark's March. And most of you will recognize it as something you hear a lot at weddings. In fact, when Princess Di and Prince Charles got married in the 80s, this is what she walked down the aisle to. trumpet was used in many different ways um, and it was all valveless until the early 1800s when someone invented it was actually keys like believe it or not a saxophone or a clarinet but we don't pretend that that actually ever happened but it actually more resembled that and what happened was somebody invented that instrument so we could play notes down lower that are closer together because before we could only play just those three notes in that particular octave but with this new instrument he wrote a concerto for us that allowed us to play any notes we wanted and through the magic of digital media i'm now going to play some of that concerto for you with an orchestra in the background that's not actually even in my house. Here we go.
was the Haydn, Joseph Haydn trumpet concerto. And as years went on, different instruments evolved. I showed you the cornet earlier. And this became kind of our primary solo instrument that we started using in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And one of the things that we really liked to play back then are pieces called themes and variations. So we play a simple theme or a melody, and then we play all these variations. So I'm going to play a quick theme and variation for you. And this is by Arben, one of the guys that put a whole book together for us to learn to play our instrument better. And this theme is the famous Carnival of Venice. And here's the theme. do for the variations? Well, we add a whole bunch of notes. So here's that same melody, but with 400 times more notes. played in other groups like orchestras, polka bands, all kinds of fun stuff. And one of the things that we hear the most trumpet in today, believe it or not, is the movies. Lots of music from the movies feature the trumpet. And nobody wrote better stuff and more recognized stuff than John Williams. So the last thing I'm going to perform for you is maybe John Williams' most famous theme of all time. And I bet you can guess what it is, and I don't even have to tell you.
force be with you. Yay! I know everybody at home is doing the same thing I am. That was beautiful. Andrew, thank you so much. Um, wow. You can play really fast. I tell you, when you practice a lot over many years, you learn to do that. I bet. So when you first started playing, um, did you sound that good? No. In fact, <laughs> in fact, usually beginning trumpet players, they don't really sound all that good, but it's just like anything else. If you haven't done it before, I mean, you're not going to be great at it until you work and work and work and work and work and take lessons from people that are professionals or teachers. And the more you do that, the better you get. That's great advice. Thank you for that. I have another question for you before we head on to our other friends today. Um, sure. What, or I should say, where is your most favorite place that you have performed? Oh, well, I played in some really fancy concert halls. I've played in humble settings, such as uh, cemeteries, when I sound taps for fallen soldiers and that kind of thing. Um, and they all, they're all great. Um, but I'd have to say maybe my favorite venue that I've ever played at is at an outdoor amphitheater in Colorado called Red Rocks. And I've played for orchestras there. I've played for rock concerts there. Um, but it's this beautiful outdoor venue with all kinds of cliffs and mountains surrounding you and the Colorado sunsets behind you. And that was really special to get to perform in. That sounds really beautiful. And it's super cool that trumpet can play for both symphonies and for rock concerts, jazz bands. I mean, what a versatile instrument. It really is. And of course I showed you all those different instruments that I play at different times. And a lot of that is because we are a part of so many different musical groups. We'll play one type of trumpet for one thing and another type of trumpet for another. That's awesome. Which means you get to have such variety when you perform. Absolutely. Andrew, thank you again so much for joining us. Hope all our friends that are watching next time we're in person come and see you after the concert, maybe wave to you as well. Sounds thank great. Thank you, Andrew. Enjoy yeah. the rest of your Sunday. And we'll see you in a little bit for a Q&A. Great. Next up, we have Mr. Brett. Mr. Brett plays the French horn, and he is a teacher like I am. Um, Mr. Brett has played or has taught at Drake, Iowa State University, Go Cyclones, um, Central, Grinnell, and Simpson, and he's performed all over Iowa too, and I'm sure outside of Iowa as well. Hi, Brett. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, Amanda? I'm doing awesome. I'm so thankful that you guys are here to play for our students that are listening into our audience. Brett, where are you located right now? Well, I'm in my basement of my <laughs> home. Uh, it's kind of my safe place to practice and not bother the house too much. And it's actually a pretty big basement, so it doesn't sound too bad down here either. Awesome. And are you in Iowa? Yes, I'm in Iowa. I'm in Colfax. All right. All right. So not too far away. Nope. Well, Brett, thank you so much for joining us today. And I want to remind our audience that if you have any questions for our brass section, um, to type them in the comments below. And Mr. Andrew, Mr. Brett, and our musicians that are coming up in a little bit will answer those questions later on. All right, Brett, I know that you've got some great information for us, and we are excited to hear you perform. Take it away. Hi. All right, everybody. I was kind of embarrassed. I don't have as many instruments as the trumpet, but I wanted to show you what an original horn was. What is this? This is a bull horn. Hold on. Everybody heard that before? Interesting, huh? Well, thank goodness we have a modern French horn too, just like the trumpets. And it looks like this. It's actually, this is a double horn. It's two horns in one. On the top side, you see these long slides here? This is the F side, and then underneath that is a whole nother set of slides. That's the B flat side, okay? So I actually get to carry around two horns at once, and that's special. But 
the one thing that uh, you can think about on this is that if I were to stretch all this tubing out, plus the bell, into one big long straight line, it would be 12 feet long. Now that's pretty long. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we make sound on a brass instrument. Okay, does anybody know? Probably not. You may have heard Amanda say something, but it takes a brain, it takes a heart, and it takes these lips. Okay, if I were to put my lips together and squeeze them and blow air, this is what I get. So I kind of have a built-in instrument on my face, don't I? Well, that's not the prettiest of sounds. It kind of sounds like buzzing bees and flies, right? Not the prettiest thing. So what they invented along with that is the, to help the buzz of the lips is what we call a mouthpiece. Now all the brass instruments use this. Can you see that up close? I'm trying to get to the camera. It's just a big funnel, okay? Now, I'm going to buzz my lips and watch what happens when I add the mouthpiece to it. <laughs> kind of makes it sound better and you actually can play some notes on it. Now, it's not the, still the prettiest of sounds. So, of course, we have to have an instrument that goes with it. So, with the mouthpiece, what happens, and all brass instruments have this, what we call a lead pipe. And that's where the mouthpiece goes into. Just like this. A little tightening there. And then all of a sudden, now I'm going to fool you here. I'm going to disconnect what I call a slide. Okay? It moves in and out and changes the length of the tubing. All right? So now I'm going to start to play. Listen to what this sounds like now. Already sounds a little different. Still not very pretty though, is it? Okay. But if I connect it back into the horn, like so, all of a sudden we get this wonderful, magical thing happening. The buzz goes into the instrument and it changes how it sounds. Now listen. Now that's a whole lot better sounding, isn't it? Now, I'd like to play just a little piece for you before I get into my large work that I'm going to perform for you. Um, this is actually an alp horn call, okay? An alp horn's a big, long, probably at least 12 feet long. It's made out of wood, and they use it to play in the alps, and it echoes through the mountains. But it sounds like this. Did you see me wiggle my fingers any? Now, Andrew's valves are called piston valves. Mine are called rotary valves. Now, the thing about rotary valves is you can't just take them in and out of the instrument. It's actually quite a bit of work to do that, so I could show you. But it's basically the same thing. It takes the air and it directs it into different lengths of the tubing. Okay? So I can push, use my thumb right here to make the air go from my F horn to my B flat horn, and then I can change the notes, even with the valves here, we call levers, move that, changes that valve inside, spins it back and forth, and I can do this. Fun, huh? Now I got a lot of notes, just like the modern trumpet does. We're always in competition between horn and trumpets. It's kind of a 
love thing we have going. Anyway, um, so let's trace what's happening. What happens? We start with the buzz. Okay, that buzz goes into this mouthpiece and then it goes through the mouthpiece. And then I direct it with my levers and changing the valves. It goes through whatever tubing I want. It goes all the way around in this big circle and comes out the bell. Okay? Now, in order to make some really good music for you right now, I'd like to play a piece that was composed by Brahms, Johannes Brahms. Okay? He wrote this orchestra piece called Academic Festival Overture. Okay, and this is one of those pieces when I was young uh, that I it's kind of stuck in my head. It was my first orchestral work that I performed with in my eighth grade orchestra. So it goes like this. Listen. <laughs> All right, Brett, that was awesome. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so a similar question for you. What's your most favorite location that you have performed? Well, I was thinking about that while Andrew was answering, and I believe I got to perform with my youth orchestra in New York City in the Symphony Hall of the New York Symphony Orchestra. So that was really exciting and just looking out what the, the musicians would see in a beautiful hall and it sounded great. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, you know, playing in those big halls is something that, you know, the, the way that the sound bounces everywhere and the way that it comes back out to you as you're performing, it's, there's a very special feeling that that creates as a musician on that stage. Um, so I, I definitely relate to that. Um, so it's, you know, what could you, you know, a quick uh, piece of advice for young musicians who are maybe going to go into band at some point, what would you, what would you say when they're picking out their instrument? Well, um, I would just, something that kind of tickles your ear when you hear it. Um, I had a brass quintet come to my fifth grade uh, uh, class and perform for us. Um, and I was just stunned. I'd never really been involved with music or anything. Um, didn't play piano or anything like that, but, uh, I was actually stunned by a trumpet player and started on trumpet actually for two years. And then the band director said, Hey, you're good enough at trumpet. Why don't you try this instrument? 
So he threw a French horn at me, and ever since then, I've never gone back to trumpet, and I've stuck with horn. But it takes practice, practice, yeah. practice. You know, that's funny. I was the opposite, and I mentioned to the guys ahead of time that I actually also, everybody knows, I think you remember, what instrument do I play? The violin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I actually started on French horn in sixth grade, and then I switched to trumpet in seventh grade so that I could be in jazz band and marching band. So that was, um, I wanted to play in jazz band. So that was my reason for switching to trumpet from French horn. Well, I'm sorry you switched. I know, it made me so sad to leave that family. Well, not really the family, but it is, it is all one big family, so. All right, Brett, again, thank you so much for your beautiful performance. We look forward to seeing you in person someday with your beautiful French horn. And until the end, <laughs> I'm stumbling over my tongue here. Um, we'll be back for a Q&A at the very end. Again, if you have any questions for our musicians, ask them below. All right, next up we have Mr. Casey. Mr. Casey is a trombonist with the Des Moines Symphony. He also has performed with the Minnesota Orchestra, Nashville Symphony, Florida Orchestra, Jacksonville Symphony. I mean, you guys, he's performed all over the United States and I'm sure abroad too. But I'm so excited to hear what he has to say. Take it away, Mr. Casey. Hello, my name is Casey Midday, principal trombone of the Des Moines Symphony Orchestra. And I'm here to talk to you about the trombone. Just like all the other brass instruments, we have three parts. We all have a mouthpiece, which we buzz into. We all have a length of tube, and we all have a bell. One thing different about my trombone, as opposed to the other instruments, is I have a slide. But it functions the same way their valves do. It makes the tube longer, and the longer you make a tube, the lower it will play. Oh, easily repairable. But that's just like a trumpet player pushing down his second valve, first valve, one and two, two and three, one and three, one, two, three. What's great about my slide is I can play glissando far better than any one of them. And I know you woke up this morning hoping today was that magical day that you learned about glissandos. A glissando sounds like this. <laughs> The trombone was invented in about 1500. They determined that the trumpet could not play as many notes as they wanted because the trumpets used to not have the valves and they could only play a handful of good notes. By adding the slide, suddenly you could play all the notes in between. So we became very popular very quickly. The trombone really hasn't changed much since its creation. It got a little bigger, they added a valve to them to some of them, sometimes two valves, and we'll talk about that in a second. The big thing they did change is the name. The trombone used to be called the sack butt. I know, I know, pure hilarity, but it makes sense because in Italian it means push-pull, which is what we do with our slide, and this is an Italian invention. Wow, that's really interesting, Casey. I, you know, that's a funny name, but I think that's really cool that you tied in a little bit of the history with, you know, what the action is of the trombone. You know, just like the trumpet, I wonder if there's different instruments or different styles of trombones. You know, could you tell us a little bit about the full trombone family? And let's introduce the trombone. This is the instrument you're probably most familiar with. This is a small bore tenor trombone. This particular instrument is from 1910, and it sounds like this. instrument that I play most frequently in orchestra. This is a large bore tenor trombone with an F attachment. And that's this valve here that adds this length of tubing so I can play lower. Without it, that's my lowest note. By adding that tubing, I can play all the way down to there. And if I wanted to play lower, I could use a bass trombone, which has two valves and a much bigger bell. 
The last instrument that I typically would be playing in orchestra is an alto trombone. This is a much smaller instrument, but not the smallest trombone. There's actually a soprano trombone that looks more like a slide trumpet. And this instrument sounds like this. And that's the trombone family. Oh my goodness, that was really interesting. You know, as an audience member and even a musician who's performed in symphonies, you know, I don't really know if I ever heard the difference between all of the trombones. So that was a really cool thing for me to learn too. Hey, audience members, don't forget, if you have questions for any of our musicians, you know, why they pick their instrument, some special techniques they might use, I mean, any of your questions can be answered below and we're gonna come together at the very end with all of our musicians and answer those questions for you live. All right, Casey, would you possibly perform a song for us? We'd love to hear it. <laughs>
That was beautiful, Casey. You know, I don't. I, I always think of trombone as being a really loud instrument. And yet the last few notes that you played in the romance um, by Axel Jorgensen, I think, I mean, they were so soft and so beautiful and so delicate um, that I think it's really fun for our audience members to be able to see the versatility of the trombone that you just showed us. So thank you so much for that. All right, our next perform performance, our next performer, excuse me, and performance is by Bo Atlas. Bo, join me. Hey, Bo, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you doing, Amanda? I'm doing so good. Thank you. Bo, are you located in Iowa right now? No, I'm actually in Lincoln, Nebraska at my uh, office at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln right now. So you can see I've got some lovely decorations, a couple um wooden tuba statues up in that corner, some tubas hanging out in various places. Just try to, you know, give you guys as much tuba in our little tuba chunk as we can. That's awesome. So you basically have a tuba sanctuary that you're in right now. Exactly. And that's where we like to keep it because my neighbors don't appreciate it when I take it home. I love it. I love it. So would you say that the tuba is maybe the loudest of the brass instruments that we've heard so far? What do you think? You know, I like to think it is. It really depends on the players and the orchestras. I'm sure um, the trombones or the trumpets or the horns or, frankly, the rest of the brass section would also have thoughts on that, too. I think it depends on the given day and the given musician. But, yes, we can certainly uh, give them a run for our money on the tuba. Maybe that's a question we bring into our Q&A later. So really quick, just so you guys know, um, Mr. Bo has performed with the Topeka Symphony Orchestra, Des Moines Symphony, as the rest of our musicians today, Lincoln Symphony and the Kansas City Symphony. So I love the fact that we are able to be, you know, we have musicians in Kansas City and Lincoln, and I'm pretty sure Mr. Casey's all the way down in Florida right now. Um, you know, the fact that we can be here to share music with you, through this medium, I think is extra special. So Mr. Bo, would you go ahead and tell us all about the, uh, the tuba, please? Certainly, we will do. So the tuba amongst the instruments is the baby of the instrument family where, um, you know, we heard Mr. Andrew talking about the trumpet going all the way back to King Tut's tomb. Horn had, um, there was hunting horn calls hundreds of years ago. Uh, Casey was talking about the sack butt back in the 1500s. The tuba doesn't come around until 1835. So we're just about, we're coming up on 200 years here and uh, uh, 10 years or so. Um, so we're the baby of the family. If you're thinking about, you know, trumpet is the grandpa and horn is sort of the dad and trombone is the weird uncle, we're the baby of the family. And we were invented because um, composers wanted to round out the bottom of the orchestra. We're very good at playing low. So everybody saw um, Mr. Brett talking about the horn, and he showed off his embouchure and the sound it made. Um, this is just a little mouthpiece rim. This is about what I'm putting on my face when I put that tuba mouthpiece on my face. And you're going to notice that my lips vibrate a lot slower and lower than Brett's do. <laughs> So yeah, a much lower sound. And when we plug that into the tuba, it too will make a much lower sound. So you can tell we're quite good at playing low. And that's why we were designed to play these big sonorous low tones to support our colleagues and the rest of the orchestra. However, over our uh, almost 200 year history, we've gotten better and better at doing the other things that other brass players do, such as playing in the upper register. So we can play high, we can also play fast, kind of like uh, Mr. Andrew did earlier. Just for example, and we do all sorts of cool things. We're a very jolly instrument. We're generally a bad guy entering a scene or a very funny moment. If uh, anybody has ever seen The Price is Right, I believe it's when somebody gets the answer wrong, you hear this sound from a tuba. And then there's a nice trombone slide after that, but I can't tag Casey in right now, maybe in the Q&A. So um, uh, one thing you're gonna notice is I have piston valves, kind of like Mr. Andrew did on his trumpets. Um, and I've got four of them. Tubas come with three valves, four valves, five valves, and very rarely sometimes actually six valves, as I have on this one over here. What you're going to notice with this one is it actually has rotors kind of like Mr. Brett's instrument. So we, like Andrew, can have rotors or pistons on a tuba. See, I've got four here. One, two, three, four. 
and also two here, five, six. So I can play really low using those extra valves. Like Casey was saying, adding more tubing makes the sound lower. So every time we push a valve, we're adding tubing and making the sound lower. Um, so one of the things, uh, the tuba was kind of linked coming to solo repertoire where um, violinists and piano players and lots of other instruments have had repertoire for hundreds of years. Because we're, we were created in 1835, we don't have as much to play. So um, we have uh, very few concertos comparatively to some of the other instruments. And I'd like to share one of those with you today. I've got, um, it's going to be the concerto in one movement by Lebedev. And um, what a concerto means is it's usually a solo instrumental performer with a large group behind them, whether that be a, an orchestra or a band or um, some other type of ensemble. So what we have today is a concerto is normally three movements. We're hearing a concerto in one movement. Lebedev kind of took all those big structures and kind of shrank it down into a really accessible, really fun piece of music that has a lot of drama in it. You're going to hear it start off with kind of a somber, sorrowful melody, and it's going to go through a whole bunch of different transformations and different melodies. And um, by the end, it's going to triumph over whatever sort of problem was happening over the course of the work. Um, before I start, I wanted to point out one thing. You'll notice that I have nobody with me here today, not even at my lovely piano over there. Um, but what you will see is I have a laptop sitting on this stand right here. And what it's going to do, as soon as I get it locked in, what it's going to do is it's going to play the piano for me. So if you've ever seen an old Western um, where there's a player piano with a paper roll, it's kind of like that, except my paper roll is now a digital file on my laptop, all connecting to this tiny box over here in the corner on top of the piano, which operates a whole bunch of mechanisms inside the piano that causes it to play. So for example, if I hit play on this, I've got the Lebedev all queued up. So just so nobody gets concerned when that there's not a ghost or anything playing my piano, it's actually a computer doing the work. Um, so without further ado, I would like to play for you the concerto in one movement. If you give me a second to adjust seating here. Okay. All right, is everybody ready? Here we go. Thank you. 
That was awesome, Bo. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Man, it's so much fun to learn about the tuba. And again, you know, I'm learning new stuff today. I did not know that there were tubas that had the one with the six. Did you call those valves? Sorry, yeah, rotor valves versus piston valves, right? Okay. Pistons, right, up and down like in a car, but rotor, yeah. like, um, because it's referring to um, how the valve is designed, right? These are straight pistons up and down, where um, the rotor tubas, right, we don't have that straight thing. We have these round sort of rotors here. 
and it turns. Right, so I push the button, and you see, let's get it right up to the camera there. Ah. We're actually, we're adding the tubing here. It's sort of oscillating from one setting to the other, and that sends the air through this set of piping here. I love it. I love learning all this cool stuff. Well, thank you so much for sharing. The performance was excellent. The fact that you used your computer to play the piano, like who knew technology, man, I tell you what. It's 2020. You know, it's 20. will surprise you. It is 2020. On that note, let's bring all of our musicians back up to the screen. Um, I know that they are coming in from all over the, the United States right now. And so we're gonna give everybody a minute to pop on. There we go. We've got Casey, Brett, Bo, and Andrew. You guys, thank you so oh, much God. for participating in this event and this performance. I know our concert attendees are loving it. They're loving to see your faces. I mean, man, you guys, when was the last time you all performed together? Bo, when was that? Uh, March 10th. Well, we didn't perform, but we made it to the, the dress rehearsal March 10th or so, wasn't it, fellas? Yep. Wow. I miss you guys. <sighs> you know, I miss you guys too. Uh, we got Casey's audio. Awesome. Well, I know that we have a couple of questions from our audience members, um, and they're going to Andrew. Andrew, you are a hot commodity on this one for the questions. So here we go. Um, Andrew. Do you use different mouthpieces for different horns? You are on mute, so we're gonna give you one second. If I don't know if you muted yourself or if you're muted backstage. Nope, that, that was me, sorry. That's all right. So, yes, the answer to the question is yes. In fact, here's four different mouthpieces. And as you can see, they're all different shapes and sizes, but the most important size is how deep they are. So this is called the cup of the mouthpiece, where it, just like a cup that you drink out of, right? And the shallower the cup is, the higher the trumpet that you play it on. So the piccolo trumpet mouthpiece is this one. And I know you can't really see, but it's got a very shallow mouthpiece. Whereas the flugelhorn, it's got a real deep looking mouthpiece. And so that just helps us play low and um, with a bigger sound easier and the piccolo trumpet it makes it easier to get a smaller compact sound and play higher so the, w the way that i think about that with your description is if we have a, a a pop bottle or something and we're blowing through it and it's empty the sound is really low but the more we add water to it and the where the space is at the top the less that that space is the higher the sound goes does that kind of work that way yeah that's a good analogy Awesome, awesome. So kids, when you're at home, or adults too, if you wanna mess around with you know, the different the different sounds that a water, a water bottle can make um, by blowing over the top, yeah, like Mr. Brett's doing in the bottom corner there, um, that's what Andrew's talking about. All right, next question, Andrew, um, is how long is the tubing on your various horns? You know, we heard from Brett, so let's hear from Andrew. And then Bo, I'm gonna swing that back over to you after Andrew tells us that. Yeah, so Brett mentioned that if he unbend all of the different tubes in his horn, it's over 12 feet long, whereas the biggest trumpet I have, well, I don't even have it with me, it's, it's over there, um, but let's pretend this is a B-flat trumpet, it's actually a C trumpet, but if I twisted all the metal into one long straight tube, it'd be only less than five feet, so there's that, and then a piccolo trumpet, Really, it's just half the size, so kind of half the amount of tubing. So really, about two and a half feet if you stretch this all the way out in just one long tube. So yeah, different trumpets have different tubings. Um, and again, that's what makes it play either higher or lower, similar to the mouthpieces. Hmm. That's super interesting. Thank you. You know, we had another question come in, and this one, well, shoot. No, I said that I wanted to ask Bo that question, so Bo. How long is your piping for the tuba? Or the tubing for the so tuba? So very interesting. <laughs> so the first tuba we looked at today was an F tuba, which is actually as long as Brett's horn. It's also 12 feet long. Um, what you're gonna notice though, is um, we play a much larger mouthpiece. Like we were talking about earlier, Brett has a much smaller buzz and a much smaller mouthpiece and a much, it's, it's as long, but it's not as fat. So um, when we get to our mouthpieces, you can tell they're, they're pretty big. Um, by comparison. So we do the same length, but um, bigger mouthpiece, slower vibration. And then we get actually bigger from the F tuba. 
The tuba I played on today is an E flat. It's approximately 13 feet. Um, this one back here is a C tuba. It's approximately uh, 16 and a half feet. And the B flat tuba, which is our longest tuba, is about 18 feet long. So to kind of give you guys at home some perspective of this, 18 feet might be the width of your house. Your ceilings might be eight foot tall, which means it very well could be two heights of your ceilings. That's two stories of a house. You guys, that's really big. Mr. Casey, how long is the trombone? A trombone is about nine feet long. Okay. Okay. All right. So again, maybe the height of your ceiling. You know, Casey, we've got this video thing that's going on and that's okay. We're just thankful that we're able to hear you today and that you're able to participate in the conversation. So I'm also better heard than seen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk for that. You got all of your colleagues here cracking up on that one. I want to see you. <laughs> Show us your face. All right. So we have one more question coming in, and then we're going to kind of wrap this up. Our last question from our audience is from Scott um, to Brett. Brett, yes. could you tell us about the painting that's behind you? And do any of your children play the French horn or horn? Horn specifically is what was said. Well, this painting behind me is, was painted by my mother. Wow. Uh, so I, it's pretty special to me. My mother's deceased, but uh, she was actually a really good artist. Never got famous, but uh, of course, she. this is actually an older horn, the first horn I played on. And she uh, was laying out on a couch, old couch on a porch, and she just started painting it. And next thing I know, she says, I've got a painting for you. And I go, oh, cool. So that's why I put it in the background. That's a beautiful memory. I love that. And it's a beautiful painting. Thank you. Uh, what was the other part of the question? Uh, do any of your children play the horn? Oh, yes. My son, um, by just him having to hear me practice for hours and hours and hours, he's actually playing the horn uh, at Wartburg College. Very good. Him and I would have been rivals. I went to Co College. Uh oh. <laughs> anyway, that's awesome. Okay, so one last question. This is a question for all of you. We're going to go um, Bo, Atlas, Casey, Casey, Brett. That's the order. And my question for you is what is special about being a brass musician? Bo. Um, I think the most special thing about being a brass musician, I had an orchestration teacher in my undergrad who called the 2D orchestra when the entire orchestra is playing all hands on deck. One of the great things is when you have all hands on deck, that means the entire brass section is in, which is usually a pretty big deal to me. And that's really cool because a lot of those all hands on deck moments are really big epic moments in the orchestra and that's the cool thing i think about playing in the brass section is if there's a big powerhouse moment you better believe the brass is back there playing also man can i do one shout out i know a little inappropriate uh, i just shout out to my grandma barbara Peterson. she's 99 uses facebook she's been commenting in the chat she's just great she's amazing i just want to do that shout out thank you i love it i love it and i think it's totally appropriate that you say hello to your grandma that's awesome all right, Andrew, question to you. Well, my answer is going to be pretty similar. I, I will I will say this. Um, you know, being a professional brass musician means we can play in all styles, uh, all dynamic levels. So if there's a, you know, a sensitive moment that, you know, shows a lot of emotion, as far as I'm concerned, us treble players can play that kind of music just as well as a, a violin or a clarinet um, or anything like that. But when there's an absolutely heroic, triumphal moment in a piece, you better believe, as Bo said, we're behind it. I love it. The kind of the heartbeat of what's going on in those big triumphs. That's very cool. All right, Casey, up to you. What's the best thing about being a brass musician? Going to follow in the... Uh... Bo and Andrew's footsteps, pretty much the same thing. I love that the way the brass section can fill out the orchestra. But one of my favorite things is, just like Andrew was saying, playing super soft, warm, and blended corrals. Some Brahms. Oh, man, just trombone gooiness. Big fan of that. Awesome. Thank you, Casey. And to you, Brett. Well, I agree with all their ideas of what's great about being a brass musician. Um, I love being a horn player because I can play loud, soft, warm, aggressive, 
It's just the horn's a magical instrument. And then the one thing that, of course, with this COVID situation is I'm missing playing with other brass players. I miss musicians. I really, really do. I'm tired of playing for myself. <laughs> oh, man, Brett, I feel you right there. I mean, all of our musicians, I think, are, you know, we can totally relate to that. And I think our audience can relate to it, too. I, you know, I'm seeing a lot of comments of saying, we miss seeing you. We miss hearing you. Um, so I definitely feel like our audiences are, you know, you we're missing the the real person concert experience as well but man are we not thankful for the opportunity to be able to sit here in a round table and have this opportunity to listen to music and to say hello to our friends i agree awesome yeah. well gentlemen again thank you so much for playing at our dmso at home family concert it has been a privilege to to host you and to have you join us and to share your beautiful talents with all of our friends um have a wonderful rest of your Sunday, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everybody. You did a beautiful job. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you, everybody.